Well, when we left off with our good friend Ante Pavelic. I wouldn't say good friend. Uh, yeah, I mean, none of these people that we're talking about are, <laughs> are good friends. I mean, but... Yeah, we never we've... hung out. You know. Yeah, fortunately. Although, um, I'm kind of curious to see what his life in Argentina was like. Um, Probably pretty fucking good. <laughs> um, I mean, hanging out with Hitler, who was definitely still alive, definitely and, still there with his, <laughs> living, with his flying saucers and shit. in Argentina, according yeah. to some uh, foremost the shows. Welcome back to The Empire Never Ended. This is Fritz, here with Boris and Ray, Yo. as usual, uh, here to, here to uh, continue the discussion on Yugoslavia and also the development of fascism therein. Uh, Boris, what, what, what the fuck are we doing today? Well, I mean, um, since our primary objective at some point will be to talk about the Ustasha movement, which would emerge in Croatia in 1930 then eventually come to power, be put into power in 1941. We kind of need to set the stage of what was happening in Croatia during the time period of like 1918 to 1929. And since Ray gave us a pretty good background on the events of Serbia during that time period, and we got some hints of what was going on in Croatia at the time, and Kemal set us up with right. the ideas, the founding ideas of Croatian nationalism, Croatian national thought, uh, which, you know, is obviously the ideological motivation behind, you know, Croatian national movements. Um, we're going to have to dive into the 1920s, um, which admittedly is something I'm not an expert on. So this will be like a you know, kind a of short summary of... Wait a minute. A lot no. of things that happened in that decade. <laughs> so, You're telling so me you like, lied on your CV? When you I did. I did li- yeah, yeah, yeah. You so might we'll have, have to fire a, me. We'll have three episodes on Ustasha's, like in the 20s, 30s, and then the Second World War? Or? Yes, yes. Okay. We must really like Ustasha. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't really... <laughs> I mean, because the Ustasha didn't just come out of nowhere, right? They didn't just, yeah. you know, fast forward from, you know, Ante Stachevich to Ustashes. Yeah. There uh-huh. was a pretty important time period in between. And since we covered that with Serbia, mm. we'll cover that with Croatia. Cool. So, um, yeah, let's get into it. Now, if I'm not mistaken, um, I believe Kemal's episode ended with, with Josip Frank. And yeah. mm-hmm. um, Josip Frank being a close associate of Ante Stadjevic, who advocated for this kind of emerging Croatian nationalism that was distinctly anti-Serb. Right, and yep. anti, anti-Yugoslav in its character, uh, but specifically anti-kind of Serb. Mm. And Frank, Josip Frank himself died in 1911, which is, of course, before the establishment of the common state. But his followers, who are Frankwitzi, or I guess we'll call them Frankists, um, mm. as I've seen him referred to as Frankist before, it's... Mm. probably easier for our listeners. Mm. Uh, so it's a bit like <laughs> Francoist, though. Mm. Yeah. But... Well, uh, what do you guys think? I think Frankists. Frankists or Frankists? Yeah. Whatever Let's you go prefer. with Frankists. I'll All go right. with Frankists. All right. Fuck it. So, of course, you know, the Frankists remained, you know, a political force for a while, and they would end up going on to form the core of the hardcore Croatian nationalists that would become Ustashits, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's only later. So mm-hmm. what was happening in Croatia right after World War I? Um, to cut things short, I think just Croatian politics, politics in Croatia in general – was dominated by the Croatian Peasant Party, which was also known as the Croatian Republican Peasant Party, the Croatian mm-hmm. People's Peasant Party, Popular Peasant Party, sure. depending on whatever the, name was cool time. in that oh, area. We'll, we'll call it. Yeah. We'll call it the Peasant Party, mm. just because. Fuck it. I mean, because there ain't so no party like changes. a peasant party. That's right. <laughs> and this party was founded by Stepan Radic and his brother Anton right in the period before. Uh, World War One, so 1904. I thought and we banned Antons on this show. It's not Anton, it's Anton. Oh, okay. So it's, it's a little bit different, but it's kind of the same, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's no Anton LaVey. I'll give tomato, you tomato. Uh, or Anton Long, uh, 
Actually, I don't think they would. Yeah, they probably wouldn't have gotten along very well. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this it, it's kind of hard to talk about the actual political ideology of the of the peasant party. I mean, it was rooted in this kind of idea of agrarianism, which was popular at the time, and kind of Croatian nationalism, Croatian self-determination. But it kind of, they're like quintessential flip-floppers throughout their entire mm. career. They're always kind of switching allegiances, uh, kind of getting pissed off at someone, making alliances with somebody else that falls apart, they move on, and they really go yeah, all the, over the, the place. Yeah. yeah, they have different factions, Yeah. yeah. And even more mm-hmm. so than, than a lot of other political movements. But in, okay. in during mm-hmm. Austria-Hungary, they were basically advocating for another Croatian kingdom within the dual monarchy. So to make it a mm-hmm. threesome. Um, <laughs> a with, thruple. Because <laughs> it would be then Croatia, Austria-Hungary. And obviously that didn't happen because World War One happened. And, um, well, they dropped that idea because... Fuck it, that wasn't going to happen. But there were actually uh, Croatian political parties that even after World War One continued to advocate this, but they were like totally marginalized and nobody gave a fuck about them because, yeah. I mean... Because also like, Hungary didn't exist. So yeah, because you were like literally yeah. just identifying with the, the side that lost the war and that, and, you know... And disappeared, so... And disappeared completely off the face <laughs> of the earth. So, you know, those guys were pretty marginalized. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's fast forward to 1918. So immediately after World War I, there was a briefly existing state called the State of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, which shouldn't be mistaken, the kingdom of the same name, which wasn't recognized by, I think, anybody but Serbia. Actually, um, it wasn't completely the same. The order of the n- nations uh, was different because the kingdom was kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. And I think the state was reversed, like of Slovenes, Croats, Slovenes, Croats and, Croats and Serbs. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this state was comprised of mm. all the former Austro-Hungarian lands. Well, not all of them, but most of them that were populated by these peoples. And so they had their own national council of which the Croatian Peasant Party and Radic himself were part of. And this council would eventually vote to unite with the Kingdom of Serbia and the Kingdom of Montenegro, which had already united with Serbia. Um, and, you know, even though Radic and the, and the Croatian Peasant Party were part of this, they were hesitant to, hesitant to, to pass the resolution um, without their kind of terms being fulfilled, which was kind of greater Republican um, rights for, for the state of Croatia within, within that union. But they voted basically to do it anyway. Um, and it happened. So the yeah. Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes was established. And, you know, the Croatian Peasant Party was given seats in the new parliament, but they abstained from taking them. Radic, mm. of course, um, said that there was no guarantee for federalism, which would give Croatia some more of equal footing, and that there was too much potential power for the Karadžovic dynasty, which, you know, is, is true. And Radic found himself getting arrested in 1919 um, after giving a statement that, in fact, the new kingdom was illegitimate because it re- wasn't ratified by the Croatian parliament, which was separate from the state council of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs. Mm. Uh, and therefore, it was illegitimate. And, you know, got a judge dynasty, didn't like that too much. And yeah. they arrested him, but they didn't charge him. And so he was released pretty quickly in 1920 before parliamentary elections that happened then. Just to um, mention quickly, uh, the, the new established state of the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes is much more well known under its name Yugoslavia. Right. So people would like that's what we're talking about. It's Yugoslavia, but it uh, the name uh, Yugoslavia was given given to it nine years after it was established in twenty nineteen twenty nine. Right. So. I mean, we will be referring it to it as Yugoslavia from, from yeah. now on, basically. So back to Radic and the mm. Croatian Peasant Party. After he was released from prison, uh, he was able to resume his political activities to an extent, um, and the party did quite well in those elections. Um, and although, I mean, again, they protested, uh, the parliament and abstained from taking part for quite some time. And the elections were a little bit contentious too, because of some of the kind of clever political maneuverings regarding like how, um, regarding representation, because Serbia had lost such a disproportionate amount of people in the war that they insisted on using the census from before World War One to determine Serbia's population, 
mm, which counting you know, Serbia had lost, like literally, like I think something, you know, by some estimates, like almost a third of its population, mm-hmm. and at least a third of its male population, which were the only people that could vote anyway. So mm-hmm. um, this caused some like major issues as to like how many seats were to be allocated to, you know, different regions. And so, of course, the Croatian Peasant Party abstained and the Communist Party had been banned due to success in kind of municipal elections in 1920 in Belgrade and Zagreb. Um, and they were banned subsequently. Um, yeah, they won local elections and they were de- then they were banned because they won. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the parliament was able to ratify a constitution, which is known as the Vidovdan Constitution or the St. Vitus Day in English Constitution, which broadly speaking kind of favored a more centralized order rather than a federalized one. I don't know, Ray, if you have some... Uh, comments on that uh no no on the the, the constitution (laughs) yeah no me neither but you're such an ardent (laughs) federalist (laughs) so since the communists had been banned and outlawed and many of its leaders went out into exile the the croatian peasant party was the the most major opponent to the yugoslav state at the time right so then in 1923 in subsequent elections they got even more votes like double the amount of votes than they'd had. And Radic was emboldened and uh, he left the country because he pretty much knew that the state was going to crack down on him at some point. He was probably right. Uh, But he decided he'd go and kind of visit different capitals to kind of, well, to get support for the Croatian national cause. And so he went to, I think, uh, the UK um, and and France, uh, Vienna. And then most interestingly and kind of fatal for him, he went to Moscow because he was invited by uh, the Soviet Union to join something that's called the Peasant International, which I, I didn't actually really know much about. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Peasant International. I mean, I, I knew uh, know about it because of Radic. Because it right, was, exactly. It, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, because it was kind of a, an irrelevant force. I mean, it was, it was a mm. common turn controlled organization that was trying to gain support from the peasantry in like Eastern Europe and Asia. So like China and like Indochina, places that didn't have an, an industrial proletariat mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to yeah. like to speak of. Um, and where peasant parties that weren't communist were becoming increasingly popular. But the thing is about the peasant international is that it was basically all the peasant parties in there were just kind of front groups for local communist parties. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, they, they were kind of inseparable from just the general communist parties in all those countries, except for when Radic decided to join yeah. the the Peasant International, which I mean, like politically, he didn't really have much in common with any of them. I mean, they weren't a communist party by any stretch of yeah, the but imagination. I mean, I mean there, obviously there were people uh, in the Peasant Party who saw themselves as socialists or left wing or certainly anti fascist Yes, like, absolutely. Because absolutely. there was a lot of them who went to fight in the Spanish Civil War as volunteers. So yeah. obviously that existed. Yeah. It existed, but the you know, the general politics of the party, you know. Yeah. I mean there was also it, members of it who collaborated with Ustasha's later during the Second World War and members who who were fighting in the partisans, so there obviously there were differences among Yeah, them. I mean it kind of seems to me like a this kind of like marriage of convenience, right? I mean Yeah. The Soviets knew that that they had a pretty strong presence in in Croatia, right? That mm. they had, um, you know, the ear of the peasantry there, probably more so than some of these kind of front group peasant parties in other countries. And they also, you know, weren't necessarily opposed to Croatian national statehood within some sort of socialist federation, right? Yeah. So they, but I mean, it doesn't really matter because. Because the Croatian Peasant Party never ended up sending delegates to the Peasant International, but it did matter for him because when he came back, the Yugoslav government immediately arrested him um, and, in fact, briefly dissolved the party. Um, she arrested a bunch of them um, and dis- dissolved the party um, because they had this anti-communist legislation that existed okay. from banning the communist party. So I was going to ask if he, got, was, if he got arrested for nationalism or communism. Because I guess For communism, yeah. yeah okay. it's, you, you joined... You joined a group that is controlled by the common turn, basically. So you just joined the Communist International as far as they're concerned. Yeah, maybe to just briefly comment that the common turn, not only did they not uh, object to the formation of some kind of a Croatian right. national state, they, they were explicitly for something yeah. like that. They were actually against Yugoslavia uh, 
as a centralized state or even as a state uh, exists. This is purely so, because of Radic? No, no uh, because no. of the Leninist, Leninist like pro-nationalist politics, the, the idea of the emancipation through a national revolution. So they thought, you know, that the, the way forward is for each nation to emancipate itself and form their own national state. So there was a conflict inside of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia at the time, which was like maybe dubiously called the conflict between the right wing and the left wing of the Communist Party in Yugoslavia. And the, the, the so-called right wing was the, the wing of the party that didn't want to dissolve Yugoslavia or uh, maybe not even that they were not they were not supportive of nationalist uh, movements or what at the time they called national uh, national revolutionary movements that mm -hmm. wanted to destroy Yugoslavia. So and the left wing, like they call, I mean the the the, the whole terminology, what is left and right, uh, is determined by the the ones who won in the fight and historically then determined who was the leftist. So the left uh -huh. position won. So they call themselves the left wing of the party. They were uh -huh. the ones who were supportive of the, the nationalist, uh, the nationalist uh, movements of Macedonians and Croatians, uh, which they saw as fighting against the dominance of the Serbian bourgeoisie. And the right uh, uh, wing of the Communist Party, they had the view that there there is a dominance of Serbian and Croatian bourgeoisie who are fighting each other for the, uh, the dominance. And that I think maybe there was some kind of influence of Rosa Luxemburg mm -hmm. uh, on sure. the right wing. Uh, that, so they didn't see it necessary for like uh, some kind of a nationalist solution. They just thought, okay, we'll have just a big Soviet Republic and that, that will join the Soviet Union basically at some point and that's it. We don't need to establish, you know, Soviet Croatia, uh, 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 Soviet Macedonia, Soviet Serbia, and so on. Man, yeah, who knew for... Yugoslav political history was so complicated? Yeah. <laughs> besides everybody. Yeah, besides <laughs> literally everybody. Yeah, I mean, you can see how the, the, the left, the so-called left wing of the party won in the the way the, the socialist Yugoslavia was organized as a federation of nation states, basically, right. after yeah. the Second World War. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no parties, just nations. Yeah. Yeah. So again, um, the party was dissolved, but it was allowed. So we're in 1925 yeah. right now, by the yeah. way, um, in case anybody's keeping score. It's 1925. January 1st, 1925 is when they were dissolved. But they were allowed to continue to participate in parliamentary politics, probably because they couldn't keep it dissolved for too long. Right. You can't just dissolve a major party like that in a parliamentary system and kind of not expect some sort of backlash from that. So they were allowed to participate in the elections and they did, they fucking killed it. They did like uh -huh. super well. Uh, stuff um, worked. And I think at this point, like Radic figured out that, you know, his, he didn't get international support. In fact, him going to the Soviets turned off the Western Europeans from, from this idea of Croatian nationhood. They didn't give a fuck about him anymore. And then he realized that he had a massive backing and, you know, had the potential to really form meaningful coalitions in parliament. And so basically he dropped most of his previous politics. And this is where uh, they lose where they lose the Republican part of their name uh, because he sent his, I think, nephew, I think Pavel Radic, um, to parliament in which he read a statement that recognized the legitimacy of the Karadjordjevic dynasty and their intention to continue working within the existing parliamentary structure. Um, although, I mean, they did have some sort of stipulations about wanting to reform the constitution at some point, but you know, they, that's they, down the yeah. line. They, you know. they were still for a, like a federalist uh, way of organizing Yugoslavia, I think, but not yes, necessarily yes. for an independent re Republic of Croatia or something like this. Yeah. Right. I think okay. that's the, the important thing though, I think in this context is recognizing the legitimacy of the Karadjordjevic, which is which yeah. they previously oh. never did. Mm. Um, and so after some negotiations, they entered into a coalition with the Radical Party, which Ray talked about in our uh, Serbia episodes. Which you can Another party that really changed often quite a lot in their right. worldview. Yeah. Indeed. And Bradic then became Minister of Education. But I think we're going to leave him right now. We'll come back to him because kind of the events that follow with him are some of the most kind of decisive events in modern Yugoslav history in terms of Serbian-Croatian relations. But we'll drop that for now. And we'll jump back to the Frankists. 
Yeah, because That's Ustasha's right. that are, are like team, they really don't have anything directly to do with Radic. We were talking about him because he's an important Croatian politician, the most important Croatian politician at the time. But Ustasha's their heritage is from a completely different political party. Okay. Right. And right. what happened to Radic would then kind of galvanize support yeah. for more extreme factions, which which didn't happen. Sounds like something bad happened. I'm a little worried. Yeah. Something bad happens, I think, throughout this entire story yeah. of like the decades between the interwar period. It's not exactly a happy period. I mean, it's quite, it's about. very bad, but you know, I think uh, things, things just keep getting worse and worse. So, Well, all right. I guess I'll roll another one. <laughs> so now we go back to the Frankists, right? Mm -hmm. And the Croatian Party of Rights, which, if we remember, Camo um, is, of course, not only against the Yugoslav state, but vehemently anti-Serb. And yeah, we have a whole episode. Whole uh, episode. Go back and listen to it. <laughs> no. Kemal's great. No. Uh, if for some reason you're listening to this episode without having listened to the previous ones. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It mm. doesn't make sense, no. but you're in the wrong place. Go back. Go um, back. <laughs> in fact, go back to the beginning of the arc and just get it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, the Frankists would then, of course, form the core of the upcoming fascist movement. So... The leader at this time was the son of Josip Frank, right? Ivo Frank, who basically from the start of Yugoslavia immediately went into exile. I mean, he went into exile in 1918 and lived in Hungary for most of it, I believe, um, in Budapest. Um, but the party did exist in Yugoslavia. But kind of like what we saw with what would happen to Zbor later, they were not particularly popular. I mean, they only had kind of this middle-class support in Zagreb. And they were kind of envious of the peasant party, right? They, they like, wanted to have that kind of support in the masses, but they just, like, didn't have it. So, like, I think in the 1920 elections, they had, like, 10,000 votes, and, like, 0.7% mm. of mm. the electorate. And, like, 1923 was, like, even less, like 8,000 mm. or something. Mm. But it was enough to kind of pass the threshold. And so, you know, they did have, you know, one or two delegates at any given time. But, the like, they weren't... Yeah. In the mm -hmm. parliament, and particularly, I think, in the in the city government in Zagreb, mm -hmm. um, which is what we'll get to um, in a little they bit. They had one very important guy who was a, a, a deputy in the yes, parliament in, in we, Belgrade. We, we, will get, we will get to him. <laughs> um, so, I mean, Ivo Frank kind of saw the writing on the wall, right? I mean, he saw that his party wasn't doing shit. Red Rum. Uh, Red Rum. <laughs> He saw his party wasn't doing shit, like they weren't, they didn't have particularly popular support. And he kind of spearheaded the idea of really going in to get support from abroad, but not, you know, in the lovey-dovey, like, oh, let's, you know, talk about the rights for Croatians. No, he went to our friend Gabriel Denuncio. Yeah. And, and Fiume. And he's my favorite know, Pokemon. Yeah, I mean, he had the kind of proto-fascist statelet um, in, in Fiume, which is now Rijeka in Croatia. And they signed an agreement, basically, Denuncio. But so there were some other uh, anti-Yugoslav emigres there as well, um, mostly, I think, Macedonians, uh, some, some Slovenes, some Albanians, who signed a, an agreement that basically Denuncio would um, provide arms and logistic support to some sort of insurgency that would happen sometime in the future. So it was Denuncio, it was not Mussolini. No, no, it was Denuncio. Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. This Because uh, this happens later, actually, too, with Pavlic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But based kind of... I mean, it's okay. based on the same memorandum. It's based on the same agreement. So this is so this in July of 1920. Of course... How did they uh, deal with the obvious fact that they, the both parts of this coalition wanted the same territory for themselves, like for Italy or Croatia? How did they ever? Oh, oh, Frank was like completely willing, as the Ustashos were later, to give the Italians what they wanted. Oh, mm -hmm. all right. I mean, Denuncio in this case was actually talking about, he was speaking in the name of Italy mm. and not, you know, just his whatever city state that he ran. Um, he was speaking for Italy. Not as though, a I mean, crazy poet. Know he could do that. But as a, not uh, as a crazy poet <laughs> that had like a... Adventurer. <laughs> Yeah, like a weird state lid in, yeah. in, but of course, like you know, his his little experiment in last long. So, uh, so I mean, basically, you know, they Frank Evil Frank made this deal with Denuncio, but you know, this was in July of 1920, and Denuncio was out of there at in like December. 
So, I mean, there was, you know, there was not really any time to have that materialize. But it's important because the Worcester shows would basically do the same thing like 10 years later. Um, and so, enter Ante Pavelic. <laughs> <laughs> About time. You can- <laughs> Give us the real fascists. Come on. Enter, 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 Ante Pavelic. No, no more of this proto fascist bullshit. It's it's still proto at this point. Although I did find a uh, make an interest, interesting observation. I'll see what you guys think about this. So proto fascism can sometimes be worse than fascism. Indeed. So Ante Pavelic is of course would go on to become the leader and the founder of the Ustasha and, and then of course the Croatian Fuhrer, basically, yeah. Boglovnik of the independent uh, state of Croatia. And he was born in Herzegovina, Bosnia, Herzegovina, in 1889. Why do we know this year? <gasps> well, it's the same year as Hitler's, Hitler's birth, which we have to date makes everything me... from the year of fan now. Is that mm. what you're doing? Yeah, but this, are you trying this, to bring this that makes back? me question. I, are there, do you, th- are, I don't know. Are there any Croatian Nazis that use year fan for Pavelic? Mm. You would have to calculate it slightly differently because. Hitler was born in April and Pavelic was born in July, I think. So they have different New Year's. Mm. But they'll just go back to maybe like a, I don't know, maybe they'll find a way to go back to go to like a nine month system to combine them into the same month so they don't have to worry about it. Maybe we shouldn't just, give them just, ideas. Huh? Yeah, mean, you're right. You're right. Too many. But I'm really curious. I, if anybody knows if there's a Croatian year fan, let us know. I think probably not. I mean, there's only one Vintex, I think. Yeah, but yeah, and I guess 09A never had that. No. Kind of same foothold. I mean, they have some people in Croatia. Mm. They're probably not even, they're probably not even astute enough to know to make that connection. They would also use like the original ancient Slavic word for Feyen, so we would never know what the fuck it is anyway. Mm. Yeah. But Pavelic was a guy who, again, kind of reminds me of James Mason in the sense, in that he got involved with the, with the, with the Croatian Party of Rights and became like a Frankist at like a very young age. I mean, he was still in high school, I believe. Which he slept on their floor. They lived like dogs. Uh, uh, I mean, I think he did. Yeah. He got into some trouble with them. I just want to yeah. notice how completely fucked up we are now because we can't even talk about know, anything. Our brains, our brains, any are topics just about n- and not compared to James Mason and David Mayer, the most important people in history. <laughs> right, that is literally how I have been interpreting this whole arc, like yeah. through that lens. Ooh. Which one is the base? Which one is Maya? Which one is fucking Mason? Okay. Yeah, I just compared him to Mason, who who lives in fucking like Colorado mm. and is just a complete shithead. I'm comparing him to a guy who like actually sees like state power and committed genocide. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like different times, genocide. though. You know, it's a first yeah, a strategy, times. then as far as but kind of for thing, uh, yeah. veteran listeners, they, then again, you know, a strategy. They'll understand. So yeah, I mean, he was that. He was active in in the. He was a Frankist in in the Croatian Party of Rights as a youth, and you know, kind of was involved with some of their activities during the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But he ended up going to school, got a PhD and a law degree, uh, right on like the onset of World War One, and following the establishment of the state, common state. Um, he was elected as a deputy in the Croatian Party of Rights to uh, Zagreb City Council and kind of quickly began to the, the Buttigieg like, climb path. the ranks. Mm-hmm. The Buttigieg path. Wait, is that Buttigieg? Oh, mayor oh yeah, he's the, the mayor of... Whatever the fuck he's the mayor of a small town, and this is like, yeah. you know... Uh, Zagreb, I guess, is... was pretty small at the time, but important. Yeah, it is important, you're right. More important. More important than Buttigieg. Definitely more important than Buttigieg. You heard it here, anyway, guys. <laughs> you heard it here. Ante, now you see, but now your brain's cooked because you're making co- comparisons between Ante Pavlic and Pete Buttigieg. Well, you know, I'm trying to find an anchor point. Who's, yeah. Whose only claim to fame is that, like, I mean, he failed, right? He's right. a complete failure. But that Trump uh, made fun of him by being like, it's an impronounceable name. Boot Edge Edge. <laughs> what is it? What is it? What kind of name is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he would have had an easier time with the name Pavlic. Mm. Like, Pavlik, we love him. <laughs> Pavlik. Str- yeah. Strong guy, big guy, strong. Tony um, Pavlik. <laughs> so since Pavlic was a Frankist and pretty hardcore anti-Serb, which, you know, you know, quite vocally so, he got arrested with some high-ranking party members in 1921, and he represented them all in court. Um, he still did go on to lead a delegation of his party to meet with Nikola Pashic, the leader of the Radical Party, which Ray 
kind of briefly mentioned in a previous episode, uh, but which basic, basically would have had the Croatian Party of Rights turn into the Croatian Radical Party, make it into a branch of the Radical Party in exchange for some guarantees for Croatian autonomy. Now, he kind of wanted to do that to fuck the peasant party because they were at the same time. This is literally, like I think, in the exact same time in which the Radical Party was making negotiations with Radic. Yeah, this is a very and bizarre so, and kind of com- very unknown episode in the history when maybe we should like point this out uh, or repeat the future Ustaše party was considering to become a branch of the dominantly Serbian radical party in Croatia, which is so, and the guy who was negotiating that was Ante Pavelic. So very right. interesting. Uh, y- viewers, sorry, listeners can't see this. Mm-hmm. Listeners can't see this, but um, Ray is clearly explaining this mm-hmm. to like thousands of nationalists. <laughs> yeah, with his hands. saying this with his hands, <laughs> yeah. like speaking with forcing his hands. them forward with each word to make sure. <laughs> Okay, like everyone here is chopping this. the air. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is. I mean, it's 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 fucking crazy, right? I mean, mm. he's representing a party that, for almost its entire existence, uh, was so vehemently anti-Yugoslav and anti-Serb that, like, they wouldn't even consider. In fact, like, at, at, at some parts, point in time, there was a branch of of um, the Party of Rights. I keep on saying the Haspe, the Party of Rights that wanted to stay with the Austro-Hungarian, like the, the losing side and like, you know, uh-huh. work with them instead of working with Serbs. Um, All right. And here we are, we have Ante Pavlic just chatting away with Nikola Pasic. Yeah, and... it's so interesting to me this idea. I was thinking maybe we can do, talk more about it in one of the premium episodes about these negotiations. With, you know, this whole yeah, idea yeah, of having because, a... Because, because yeah. like I said, it's literally happening at the exact same time that the peasant party is. So, I mean, hmm. the Radical Party is weighing their options, right? If if one fails, they'll get the other, right? Yeah. And and in terms of Pavelic and, and the Party of Rights, I mean, they figure, okay, if we can fuck over somehow the peasant party, that helps us no matter what, mm-hmm. right? But, of course, that didn't happen. And so um, nothing came of it. And, you know, Pavelic kind of continued to make connections with other nationalist groups at the time. He represented some nationalists that were Macedonians that were arrested for uh, like anti-state activities and whatever. And then in 1927 was elected as a delegate to parliament. So at this point he in Belgrade, goes to Belgrade yeah. and, and he serves from 1927 to 1929 when everything goes to shit. Mm. So what went to shit in 1929? Or 1928, rather. He was there till 1929, but the bad shit happens in 1928. Specifically, the 20th of June, 1928. So what happened? We know that Radic formed a coalition with the Radical Party, right? He was Minister of Education. That didn't go so well, and the coalition started to fall apart. Now, Radic entered another kind of unlikely coalition with the Independent Democratic Party, which was the primary Party of Croatian Serbs at the time, which is led by Sveta Zepribicic, who was... You're right. Okay. We discussed the uh, a little while yeah. back. Yeah. Right. So you can also refer to that. But I mean, it, it was it was an interesting coalition, right? Because Pribicic had been a longtime supporter of kind of a more centralized order um, and was pretty loyal to the monarchy and to regime in Belgrade. So this was... A, and then a switched pretty, his politics. Pretty, and then completely yeah. switched his politics to join in into a coalition with, with Radic and they formed together. And they, they, uh, the, the common thing they had is that they wanted a federal state. Uh, right. So, yeah. So basically the, the Croats and the Serbs from Croatia or their main political parties were in a coalition advocating a more centralized state uh, against the regime in, the, in Belgrade. Yeah. And so they together formed the what was known as the Peasant Democratic Coalition. And, you know, they were working together against the Radical Party until the morning of June 20th. Namely, if you remember what we discussed in previous episodes, you'll know that a Montenegrin Serb who was a member of the the Radical Party, Pony Šaracic, got into some, uh, let's say, verbal disagreements. In Parliament. uh, (laughs) In Parliament. Um, uh, Specifically, he he was continually uh, insulted that that members of the um, peasant party were accusing him of being a plunder for, you know, stealing. Uh, Shere talked about this, um, robbing the Muslims in, in Macedonia and the like. And he was 
demanding an official sanction from the parliament to sanction the um, these members of, of the peasant party, and peasant, peasant democratic coalition too. That didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, this, what do you do? Like, I, I, I think we talked about it briefly, but like he was a Chetnik. He was a, like a, a Serbian kind of super nationalist militant guy with history in war, probably war crimes. And also a part of this wave of Serbian nationalism in Yugoslavia, this was always reminding the Croats how it was the Serbs, Serb sacrifices that uh, made Yugoslavia possible and so on. And this was kind of really getting on the nerves of the members of the peasant party. So they were saying these things that Boris described to, back to him. And yeah. Yeah. And when, when the parliament refused to sanction them, he pulled out his pistol yeah. and opened fire. Yeah. Um, to defend Serbian honor and the honor of the Serbian like army or something like this. How else are you going to do that? Yeah. That's. Yeah. I mean, the only way do to do that mm-hmm. is to produce a pistol from your jacket and yeah. in parliament. Shoot. <laughs> yeah. Step on Adic. And, and shoot another member. Four other people, yeah. um, two of which died on the spot. Um, How can you not be proud of that? No. Yeah. Radic was shot, I think, in the stomach um, and was mortally wounded. I mean, he died like several weeks later, I believe, Yeah. in hospital. But of course, I mean, this this was a big deal, right? I mean, yeah, the leader huge, of the biggest, yeah. the biggest Croatian party uh, was murdered along with other party members in parliament in the middle of... High noon, basically. Yeah. So predictably, what happens? Riots, uh, primarily in Zagreb. Um, by m- the accounts I've read, they lasted about three days, um, where it was mostly students who erected barricades throughout Zagreb, um, or you know, fighting with the police. And three students were killed by Zagreb police. Um, this was obviously. The start of not a beautiful friendship. <laughs> I mean, this this galvanized opposition towards the monarchy. Um, these students were immediately martyred uh, and became martyrs. Uh, the sites of their death, actually, from what I've read, were you know pilgrimage sites to uh, to other like nationalists for years to come. Um, and it triggered a nationwide political crisis. Right. So I mean this. This is a political crisis that kept going for a few months, right? I mean, this is June 1928, and when we come around to January, in the beginning of 1929, King Alexander, of course, abolishes the parliament, dissolves all political parties, abolishes the constitution, and institutes a dictatorship, um, which is known as the January 6th dictatorship. And and this is also when the, the country's name is changed to Yugoslavia. Officially, yeah. yes. The, the the January dictatorship is important for reasons that we'll get into primarily in, in the next episode um, when we deal with the 30s. Um, but what happened immediately in the aftermath of the shooting of Radic and then the dictatorship is that basically most of the most hardcore um, political dissidents went into exile, um, including Pavlic himself, right? So... Pavlic, at this point, kind of starts connecting with, with people that were already out of the country. Because you have to remember that political emigration was happening for the whole past decade in varying, varying degrees, right? So even after Radic's first arrest, right, in like 1920, there were people that had started to leave the country. And in general, emigration from Yugoslavia for non-political reasons, for economic reasons primarily, was was happening all the time. So there were, you know, this is the period in time in which lots of people are then moving to the United States, Canada, Germany, Chile, Argentina, um, anywhere for economic reasons. But political emigration then um, happened in a big way after the assassination of Radic, because then even people in the peasant party were starting to get more radicalized. Pavlic, once he decided to leave Yugoslavia, um, had made connections to political emigres, but more importantly, he had done something in 1927 when he was on a state visit to Italy that would prove to be incredibly important for his future career. Namely, when he was on this state visit, he made a secret visit to some officials, Italian officials, um, to uh, establish 
basically a connection that the same kind of connection that Frank had hoped to establish with Denuncio. In fact, Frank had they'd coordinated this so that Frank on the same day had gone to the Italian mission in Budapest and submitted a revised version of the memorandum that he made with Denuncio, mm-hmm. um, which which stated that uh, which was asking basically for Croatian support uh, for for Italian support for an insurgency against the Yugoslav state. This was all hush hush until. Pavelic left Yugoslavia, right? So then he already had connections in, in Italy, primarily. I mean, first he went to Budapest. Uh, he went around a little bit, but then would eventually go to Italy, mm-hmm. which is where he would found the Wustasha movement, and then the Italian state would give him, um, would protect him for a long period of time and allow for these training camps um, for, you know, Wustasha terrorists and also other anti-Yugoslav um nationalist forces to train um and that's where we'll pick up uh in the 1930s because the ustasha movement at least for this uh for the for the purposes of this it's very nice that it starts exactly in 1930 because <laughs> yeah yeah because then we can really and... separate this we can really separate this by decades pretty easily yeah that's great thank you um, Ustasha, and the thanks. 1930s will be a completely different story right uh this is an era that's characterized primarily by Ustasha um, terror um, and the emigre community coming back in a very big way. Yeah. Uh, pretty much immediately after he left, I mean, as we established before, he had these connections in Italy, right? He had made them in 27. And he decided to, you know, first go and reconnect with some of the old crew, with some of the old... Um, Frankist uh, emigres that were out there in Europe and get and the so gang the first back together. yeah get the gang back together and so the first place to go was was Hungary and and um, there were, there were quite a few of them there and some of them were this even like old school emigre community as we know um, evil Frank himself lived there and whatever so you know after bouncing around talking to you know various different emigres. He made good on his um, agreement with Mussolini's Italy. And he went to Italy and pretty much immediately had support of the fascist government there. Um, The previous agreement that they had made basically stated that, you know, if Croatia were to get independence, uh, Italy's dreams for the Mare Nostrum or whatever it was called would be fulfilled. Italy would get the territories that it desired in Dalmatia and Istria uh, in exchange for basically for Croatian independence. Um, Bavlić had no problem with that. Um, And so, you know, the Italians allowed him to set up a headquarters on the island of Lipari. But at the same time, he also had um, another training camp. So they set up several training camps. Um, this was right as the Ustasha movement was officially founded. Now, the, the dates on that, from what I can tell, don't actually exist. There's not like an official date. I mean, Pavelic later said that the date of founding the Ustasha was the, was the day after Radic was assassinated. But we know that that's actually not true. Um, yeah. Like the name Revolutionary Movement Ustasha um, was coined in 1930. And I mean, the name itself, it means something like insurrectionists, the, the word Ustasha. Yeah, and there's also um, a, a, a military rank in, mm-hmm. um, in, in the Habsburg Empire that it corresponds to as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it means, you know, whatever, insurgent or revolution mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, so, I mean, they set up this, this headquarters. Um, in, in Italy, and another one in Hungary, which, uh, of course, was was under Admiral Miklos Horthy, which I always... Ah, yeah. Who's, who's an interesting figure because he's an admiral in a country that had become landlocked. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's the only case in which you had a head of state who was an admiral of a place that had no sea. I mean, their greatest body of water is like Lake Balaton or something. It's a great and, body of water. The, the <laughs> fact that the Navy still exists. The Navy still exists. Yeah, yeah. that's because in, uh, like in Austro-Hungary, I think Rijeka or Fiume was officially yes. in Hungary, right? Yes, so, yes. Yeah. They, they, they had access to, to the yeah. sea and have oh, always kind it? of lamented mm. the loss of that. Um, 
But either way, they had this uh, this this second uh, base in uh, this place called Yanka Pusta mm -hmm. in Hungary, which will later become relevant. Um, but for now, um, Pavelic founds the Ustasha movement and sets up with um, with this base where he's supported by Mussolini, and th basically they're allowed to do whatever they want. It's a, it's a terrorist training camp. They had made connections with Macedonian revolutionaries before. I mean, Bavalich had defended them in Yugoslavia, and then he met with some of their emigres, and they came to a common understanding, the, the VMRO or the IMRO, the, the English. Well, um, let's just call it VMRO. VMRO. Mm -hmm. the, uh, what's their name, though? The... Uh... Uh, In, internal Macedonian, internal Macedonian revolutionary, uh, revolutionary organization. Organization, thank you. So they met in uh, 1929 in Sofia. Yeah. Uh, I, I think in sound like this, uh, signed the Sofia Declaration of Cooperation between Ustashas and Vimero. And but this I actually mean, prompted uh, his, his mm -hmm. exile, right? Because the Yugoslav government found out about that and mm -hmm. immediately sentenced him to death. Okay. Uh, if he would ever re return to Yugoslavia. I mean, I was looking a little bit of like the, uh, uh, like uh, reading on the history of Amaro. I mean, that's like we should do uh, like at least one episode on it Absolutely. at some point. Yes. It's very yeah. complicated. I mean, it's a, it's a like a nationalist organization that like was founded in the end of the 19th century and then existed for many decades after that. But it went to a lot of change. It had different factions. So I mean, it was. It's an, like a Macedonian nationalist organization, but it also, in some sense, it's a Bulgarian organization, and it had like different factions. Some were supporting the idea of Macedonia being a part of Bulgaria. Some wanted uh, um, autonomous Macedonia as a part of the Balkan Federation. They also had like socialists and even some anarchists uh, there, but also like right wing people and even like people who were cooperating with Ustasha's, as we know. Right. But they, they also had like a few parallel, like in the 20s and 30s, they were like parallel Vemeros, I think. In one uh, faction of it, which was called, uh, I think, Vemero United, uh, something like this, it was um, aligned with the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, I think. Okay. And also maybe other Communist parties as well. In Bulgaria, I think, right? Similar. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, so, I mean, yeah. the, the word, the concept Macedonia and XU kind of. It, it like brings up images of mixed salads, kind of chaotic admixtures. It's very Macedonian yeah. somehow. I think. But also, when when we're talking about Macedonia here, we're not just talking about the present day Republic of Macedonia, or North Macedonia, or whatever. This also included Greek Macedonia, mm -hmm. um, Bulgaria, you know, Bulgarian Macedonia, all the Macedonians, and also Thrace, which is. Um, now in Turkey, right around Adrina, Adrianople, um, the original it's a shit Vimero, ton of territory. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's it's a very large territory, and and Vimero is important because they different factions at different times continued a certain type of uh, degree of guerrilla warfare against both the Yugoslav state, the Greek state. Um, they were based at different points, also from Albania, from um, yeah, they from they Bulgaria. were like, they had like oh, various rebellions against the Serbian state, and then later against the Yugoslav state because uh, after the Balkan Wars, w what is now called the Republic of North Macedonia, which is an independent state, um, and or also called as Vardar Macedonia, became a part first of Serbia and then of Yugoslavia. So, yeah. and this is the reason why Vimero had like many armed rebellions, sometimes with different allies. Like at some point they had a, like a rebellion together with some uh, Albanian insurgents against the the Yugoslav state. And yeah. But they had initially fought against the Ottoman state. Yeah. Um, in, in its earliest phase. I mean, this is like in, in very interesting history because initially, like also, I mean, uh, this one faction of it uh, in the early days wanted, as I said, Macedonia to be a, a state uh, as a part of the Balkan Federation. So a lot of, like, they were um, open to a lot of ethnicities. So they had, like... Yeah, I was going to ask what a, what a Macedonian meant at that time, what it meant. For a lot of men, it meant, like, a, a, like a, a special kind of, like, Bulgarian, but some had the idea of, of it as being, a, like, a, a, a separate nationality, that maybe the one that needs to be developed. But they were open to all people 
at like some of them at some time. So they had like Vlach members, they had Serbian uh-huh. members. And I mean, this is the this is the this part of history when we mentioned a few times before, like Chetniks. So uh, some VMRO fighters were calling themselves Chetniks. So uh, they okay. were like also Bulgarian, Macedonian Chetniks. Also, the, the word the, the other term that's used interchangeably with Chetniks is Komite. So right. I mean, it sounds more a little more like. Uh patriotism the nationalism somehow because of this i think in the initial stages maybe but later i think it would take a a much more explicit national character in in many ways i think it's it's a nationalist movement in the sense of like original 19th century nation building movements i don't know Mm -hmm. but i would just of a uh, common tongue the shared mythology that kind of thing although i mean the the vimito anarchists i think in, in thessaloniki perhaps weren't weren't so invested in being Bulgarians or Macedonians. They uh-huh. were categorized as such by the Ottoman state when they mm. when they repressed the Slavic populations in Thessaloniki and, and committed reprisals against them and mm-hmm. basically ethnically cleansed them from Thessaloniki. Mm-hmm. But whether that was part of the program of, you know, like the Thessaloniki boatmen or not is something that I think is kind of debatable. I mean, they were fighting definitely for the for, for rights of Slavic-speaking peoples there, but I, I don't know if it was necessarily explicitly Bulgarian or, or Macedonian in yeah. that sense. Vomero, very complicated history. We should, yeah. 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 We, should, we should probably dedicate an episode to but them. In 1929, at least one faction of Vomero and Ustashas are an ally against Yugoslavia. Okay. And right. in the 30s as well. Yeah, and, and this is important for the Ustashas because they kind of modeled their um, their idea of armed rebellion off of what Vimero had, had successfully been doing for quite some time, which is kind of ironic when you go down later mm. uh, into what Pavelic says about Serbs and Chetniks mm. uh, and, and their kind of like barbaric nature mm. and... Uh, mm. Uh, barbaric nature to like you know rob and steal and and, com- and do guerrilla warfare when they allied themselves with literally the exact same yeah people who were calling people themselves who were doing exactly the yeah. who were yeah, calling right, themselves right. Chetniks <laughs> <laughs> just happened to you know yeah. have a common enemy in the Yugoslav state uh-huh. but the, but this was important because when they established this headquarters in Italy and in in in, um, in Hungary um, lots of experience Vimero cadre were there to uh, train them in, in kind of guerrilla warfare and terrorist tactics. So what did they do? Um, from the get-go, they had some ideas of destabilizing the, the Yugoslav state. Now, they, may, they mainly ha- uh, filled their ranks with people from the Croatian emigre community that was already outside of Yugoslavia. So um, mainly working class people uh, working in, in Europe, uh, lots of sailors as well, um, which is a you know, big thing in Croatia as a maritime country. And it's generally agreed that this emigre community was a lot more radical mm-hmm. in their politics than, than people that were still in Yugoslavia. Which is often the case. So like a- which is often the case. It's going to come up Again and again and again. You often um, find like the most radical nationalists living outside of the home, like old country. Yeah, yeah, and we'll see this with with Yugoslavia for decades to come. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh-huh. and and uh, and not just with Croats, of course, with 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 Serbs, and Macedonians as mm. well, and a lot of emigrant communities um, were were far more nationalist. Some, of course, weren't. There was also a large leftist and communist emigrant community as well, but. The main recruits in these Ustasha um, training camps in Italy and, and Hungary were from the emigrant community. And the, uh, I hear a dog lying. Uh, yeah, me too. That's, lying. That's, don't yeah. worry about that. That's that's Mark. on my end. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. All right. It, it adds some character anyway. Um, the dog lying. Yeah. Yeah, lying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> lying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So some of the initial first moves of the Ustasha uh, emigre terrorists was to just do some small bombings. They would they bombed some um, trains in Yugoslavia. Mm. 
um, kind of low level terrorist activity. Not much that really put them on the radar until 1932 when they did kind of their first major action, um, which is this this uh, famous Valley uprising mm. um, in 1932, which uh, we can perhaps dedicate some more time to later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but kind of in short, um, the Wustashas had sent some some cadre of theirs to some villages in, in the Lika region of, of Croatia, modern day Croatia. Um, Which is also ha- one of the areas where the war happened in the nineties. So it has a lot, a lot of like big Serbian population. So it's like an area of conflict. Yes. With, yeah. it, it's an ethnically mixed area. Mm. Also an area from which a lot of emigres came from because mm. um, it was very poor, um, very undeveloped compared to, other parts of Croatia, like Zagreb or, or whatever. Um, and they sent some people to agitate in some villages there against the Yugoslav state. Now, they had given them false hopes. Basically, they had told these villagers that if they were to rise in arms, that Italy would support them, mm. that Italy would come to their aid and invade Yugoslavia and, and set up a Croatian state. Now, Italy was supporting them, but Italy wasn't totally committed yeah. In that way, right? They weren't about to invade Yugoslavia. That wasn't in the cards. But they were perfectly happy to support these like terrorist actions. So they provided the arms, um, most of which came from what's now Zadar. At the, at the time was Zada, which was con- still controlled by Italy at the time. Mm-hmm. And well, those dishes had infiltrated some of their agents there, brought some arms, armed some, some of these villagers, uh, with the idea to attack some infrastructure, right? Kind of classic guerrilla tactics. And they attacked a police station in the area of the city of Gospic, um unsuccessfully. I mean, they had kind of hoped that Croats in the police force or in these military garrisons would then, you know, mm-hmm. rise up and, and, you know, start a full-on insurrection. So they this shot at ha- them and were surprised they didn't side with them. Yeah. Although, mm. I mean, they had done significant kind of propaganda in the region. I mean, it's it's not unlikely that some of these soldiers had maybe heard of something going on. Either way, the Yugoslav state didn't really know anything about this. Okay. And they got caught with their pants down uh, in a pretty big way. So, I mean, they basically had this insurrectionist group attack critical infrastructure that is like a police station um, in a city that was firmly under their control and had no idea who the fuck did it. I mean, they had, you know, the Ustashas had been founded before, but they, you know, and they, there were some bombings, but they didn't realize that they were capable of these kinds of actions. Okay. Yeah. And there's some interesting fallout from that. Um, I don't know if we should get into that right now or, or not uh, in terms of, what was um, what the general public and, and, for example, the communists thought about this? But, yeah, maybe we can talk about that in a in a in a premium episode. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a premium episode. So they made the they made themselves known pretty well to the Yugoslav state mm. with this action. Now, maybe still, it's maybe it's important to re, uh, remind people that so the Frankovci, the party which the Ustashas were like um, came from, was. As we said earlier, they were not the most popular party in Croatia. So it's not like they no. were like, they had like many, many supporters there. I mean, for sure they had some, but they were not a major party. Yeah. And and there was, after the assassination of Radic, some more intensified nationalist sure, sentiment yeah. in Croatia, but still like that kind of, that kind of radical separatism definitely wasn't a key player. Yeah. The yes. peasant party was still the major player in Croatia. Yes. Yes. And the peasant party, of course had all kinds of different factions in it as well. Mm. Now, the major, major thing that the Wasishas would be known for in the pre-war period came two years later in 1934, which is the assassination of King Alexander I and the French foreign minister Louis Bartou Mm -hmm. uh, in Marseille. Um, Now, King Alexander, there's some interesting political play here. Um, the French were historically Yugoslavia's biggest ally uh, after World War One, right? Um, without the French, Serbia 
the the kingdom of Serbia probably wouldn't have uh, been able to do anything for one. I mean, the French helped them regroup and yeah. and the French were the the main ally <laughs> in the allies mm. in World War One for, for the Yugoslavs or for the um, especially for the for the Karadžić dynasty, right? And they held the French in major, 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 major respect. Now, the French and the Italians were having some problems. Mm-hmm. Um, King Alexander was invited to Marseille by by the French government to basically patch up Italian Yugoslav relations. Mm-hmm. What happens? King Alexander gets off his boat. They're in this car, and an Ustasha terrorist, who is a Bulgarian by the name of uh, Vlado Chernozemsky. Uh, yeah, I think that was like his nom de guerre. I think his it was is Velichko Dimitro Kerin or something. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, he ran up on the motorcade, fired several shots, kid, killed King Alexander and the French foreign minister. Yeah, so the the king and the foreign minister were killed by a VMRO member. But initially the idea was for for the Ustasha guys to do the assassination. And this Vlado guy was supposed to train them, yeah? Yeah, yeah. and then I guess they got to Marseille and Vlado concluded that these guys weren't ready to uh, carry out the assassination, so he decided to do it himself. Yeah, man, Um, okay. Which also kind of has bears some resemblance to this assassination of Franz Ferdinand, right? I mean, mm. uh, there were on in Sarajevo that day what three potential assassins? Yeah, right. Uh, two, one of which completely bailed. The other one had a bomb that didn't explode, and then Gavrilo Princip was the one that actually mm. who, like according to myth, was eating the, the sandwich or something, right? <laughs> um, either way, I mean, uh, this guy, this Bulgarian Vimrova guy, was was killed on the spot um, by the bodyguards and also the crowd. Um, but in a way, he was also kind of... I mean, he was obviously very close to the Ustasha movement. You can find a photo of him in the Ustasha uniform. Well, so, he had been training. Uh, he had been training yeah. Ustashas mm. um, in, in, in these camps. Yeah. Now, this had major political repercussions in Yugoslavia. Um, the French immediately, you know, obviously the king of Yugoslavia was assassinated. It's a pretty big deal, no mm. matter which way you look at it. Oh, it's embarrassing um, for France, yeah. It's embarrassing for France, but the whole objective had been for France to help Yugoslavia uh, mend relations with Italy. Mm. Uh-huh. Now, the Italians had funded and armed these Ustasha terrorists, and so the logical thing would be for Yugoslavia to blame Italy mm-hmm. in the League of Nations. Under French pressure, it didn't. And instead, mm-hmm. it blamed Hungary, mm-hmm. okay. uh, using using, of course, this uh, this camp that wasn't Hungary, which wasn't the main one. The headquarters was in Italy. Mm-hmm. Either way, they didn't want to ruffle too many feathers in Italy. Uh, nevertheless, the Italians were still kind of embarrassed by this and ended up disbanding. Well, going in and, and arresting a lot of Ustashas, including, including Pavlic himself, who spent some time in prison and then spent. 1934 to almost 1941 under some degree of house arrest. So the now, so Mussolini didn't want uh, King Alexander to be assassinated or uh no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I I don't I, no, I don't think mm-hmm. I don't think that came at a, not, a politically opportune moment. Mm-hmm. Um there's also the, the the Germans were in play with this as well. I mean mm-hmm. um there was the whole Abyssinian crisis going on at the same mm-hmm, time, mm-hmm. right, with Italy and Ethiopia, which was kind of overshadowed this yeah. event. But for our purposes, the important thing is that the Italian state basically said, okay, you guys have played around long enough. Now it's fucking with us. Mm. Um, let's, uh, let's cool down a little bit. Mm-hmm. So that's essentially the kind of important parts of 1930 to 1934 for the Ustashas. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, they didn't stop existing, right? This is this is the Ustashas abroad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there were, of course, Ustashas and Frankists in Yugoslavia at the time. And unlike their counterparts in, you know, these terrorist training camps in Italy and in Hungary, the majority of the Frankist and Ustasha movement within Yugoslavia at the time was student-based. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And particularly in the University of Zagreb, um, which is kind of akin to what was what Ray talked about um, 
in the 1930s in, in, in Belgrade as well, right? Um, where the university was kind of the forefront of, of radical activity. Yeah, mostly like a big communist movement among the students and then also fascist with the help right. of the state and cops attacking the communist students and anti-fascist students. Right. Uh, in Zagreb, the situation was somewhat different um, mm -hmm. in the sense that the state was against both the communists and the Ustashas. Yeah. Um, of course, there were like still like Oriuna and, you know, other kind of right wing affiliated groups. But primarily what was going on in the campuses uh, on, on the University of Zagreb campus was was a conflict between leftist students, anti-fascist students and fascists. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and this is also where you get to see a little bit of a difference in ideology, right? Um, so it's worth noting that the Ustasha movement was ideologically incoherent mm -hmm. uh, from the get-go, and it would continue to kind of be incoherent, right? It went, it originated in this kind of Croatian nationalism of, of the Stacevic and Frankists and the like, but it started to take on a much different character in the 30s. However, there's a big difference between what was what Pavelic's personal ideology was and the ideology of these kind of radical students who had kind of a lot, a lot different, they had a lot of different ideas. <laughs> they were going in a lot of different directions, right? Mm. Uh, ultimately, it came down to Pavelic. So this might be a good time actually to read off um, the 17 Ustasha principles. Oh, great. 17. Um, 17 rules for life. It's a very principled moment. Yeah. It sounds like. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> so these are the, the, what, the 17 principles of the Ustasha, huh? Yeah. All right. The Croat nation is an independent ethnic <laughs> entity. It is a nation in itself, and in respect of nationality is not identical with any other nation, nor is it a tribe or a branch of another nation. Okay, so. So that one is pretty clear, yeah. That's pretty clear. You know, we can't read all of these the whole way through, I think. I'll just, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then cut out. And we'll cut just cut shit out and anything that's fun yeah. or worth talking about, we'll talk about. How come it goes from one to nine? Uh, I actually don't know because they are in order or no. Uh, the fuck? <laughs> I'm not saying I'm missing oh, any. Oh, so someone I mean, already made a, a this selection. Is, this is like already a cut. Yeah. This is yeah. Okay. So these are the best of the best principles. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Although it. they're I, okay. Yeah. All right. So I can I can just just skim in it then. Uh, the Croatian nation as a whole has a right to happiness and prosperity, and uh, it can be either achieved by a nation as a whole or by the individual as a member of his whole. It's a lot of holes. Uh, mm -hmm. Only in a fully self governing and independent Croat state. All right. There you go. So. In consequence of its sovereign right, the Croat nation must alone rule in the state and alone decide all state matters and national concerns. No, no one not of Croat race and Croat blood may participate in the Croat state and national leadership. And similarly, no foreign state or foreign nation may decide the fate of the Croat nation or the Croat state. Okay, so pretty Croat. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much that's, that's the first, what, like half of it, I guess, is just be Croat. All right. <laughs> Uh, so number 12, then, the peasantry is the foundation and source of all life, and as such is the chief vehicle of all state authority in the Croat state. However, all other classes in Croatia are part of the national whole because the other classes of the Croat nation whose members are of Croat blood have not only their roots and ancestry, but also an unbroken family relationship with the village. Whoever in Croatia is not of peasant descent in nine out of 10 cases, not of Croatian origin or blood, but an immigrant foreigner. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right. Uh, 13. All material and spiritual wealth in the Croat state is the property of the nation, and the latter alone is empowered to dispose of them and exploit them. The natural resources of the Croat fatherland, and especially its forests and mines, mines, let's underline mines, cannot be the object of private trade. The land can only belong to him who cultivates it himself or with his family, that is, to the peasant. Pe the, the peasants that mine, those peasants? 
Yeah, the yeah. famous okay. mining peasants. Yeah, the famous mining peasants of Croatia. Good. Uh, 15. The exercise of all official functions is bound with personal responsibility. Anyone who conducts any business in the name of the state or the nation must answer for his actions with his life and his property. Duty and responsibility before society must also be the guiding principle of every action in the private life of every member of the Croat nation. Um, so this last one's really important. So I'm, I'm bringing the dogs of war... <laughs> up into the up into the mix here uh all right the moral strength of the croat nation consists in an orderly family life in accordance with religious principles its economic strength lies in agriculture in its social collective life and in the natural wealth of the croat land its military strength lies with its organizational and soldierly qualities industry trade and commerce must cooperate for the benefit of the whole national economy these branches must become a field for honest and honorable work and a source of, a pro- of appropriately dignified life for the worker, but never a means for accumulating national wealth in the hands of the capitalists. There you go. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's very, it's not so fascist uh, so much as it's like nationalist chauvinist uh, yeah. ideology. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and this is where I'm, said like their ideology was pretty inconsistent, right? Because they drew a lot from Italian fascism or they wanted to draw a lot from Italian Mm -hmm. fascism. They had this kind of, would advocate for this kind of organic national state and and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. However, the, the 17 principles were by all accounts, the only ideology that existed in Ustasha camps. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have any ideological training beyond beyond this. Like they didn't, you know, sit there and and read different works or anything. No, they just had to basically know these 17 principles and that was it. And, and, and an important part of this, of course, is obedience to the leader, to the Boglovnik Ante Pavlic. So at the end, he called all the shots. Yeah. I mean, this is basically a program of ethnic cleansing. I mean, this is the, the, the idea of the program. I mean, this is like, why? Yeah. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead. Um, this is why I earlier said that sometimes like proto-fascism can be worse than fascism, I think. Yeah. Because like, I mean, like in the case of some like uh, Serbian Chetniks, a lot of these groups are basically, their ideology is kind of genocide. So it's, yeah, pretty brutal. Like how protoplasm is weirder than plasma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, Pavlic was even pretty early on explicit about this. I mean, he, he said about the Croat, he must be severe and merciless hmm. without mercy and pardon for his duty is to lessen the pain of the Croatian people with fire, iron and blood to crush with force the neck of the foreign parasite and so liberate his homeland. Yeah. It's, yeah. Hmm. It's pretty fashy. <laughs> and also said, uh, and this is also part of their imagery. That's, that's very important as well. The knife revolver machine gun uh-huh. and time bomb. These are the bells that will announce the dawn and resurrection of the independent Croatian state. Uh, this is probably something that they took from Vimero, I would say, because in their logo. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's what they had in their logo. But it's also interesting because Chetniks also had that. <laughs> and probably because of their common roots with Vimero, like the Serbian Black Hand, which was like <laughs> one of the organizers of the Chetnik movement, also had those exact things in their logo. So it's, yeah. So everyone's just ripping off Vamaro's style here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Babalich also had some kind of weird ideas about um, self determination, too. I don't know if, uh, how much I should talk about this, but um, he didn't, he, he didn't, he rejected explicitly Wilsonian self determination as it existed after World War I mm-hmm. and uh, defined it instead as Croatian state rights. Okay, yeah. Um, State's rights. Yeah, that's what uh, that's what Kemal was talking about, how much... I mean, that's the right. heritage of Ante Starcevic, I would say. This kind of... Right, yeah. right. So he said, um, after the World War, they had developed the idea of self-determination of nations. We Croats do not need that right because we have our historic right, and according to that right, we seek that Croatia be free. Oh, all clear. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, but this is about it for Ustasha ideology explicitly. Um, now, there was a lot of, according to Pavlic at least, now there was a lot of stuff going on in the universities and people that would be close to Pavlic 
um, and that would later become more important when when they come came to power, and um, and that those would become like you know official state ideologies. Pavlovich considered him, his ideas to be the logical progression of Stachewicz's thought, but it developed in kind of a uniquely, at least for I think the region, in a racial direction, whereby you know Stachewicz Stachewicz agreed that Croats were Slavs, right? Mm-hmm. Stachewicz believed that Croats were Slavs. Serbs kind of didn't exist. Um, but did he think Mormons were reptilian? <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, the the Croatian those Lishas had a weird relationship with Protestants, but that's that's oh, a yeah? thing too. Uh, they later considered that to be an arm of German uh, influence, but um, okay, hmm. All right. that's why they only considered like Catholicism and Islam uh, to be like the true religions of the state. But anyway, um, so the way that like those, the ideology started to develop went more along the lines of some kind of new racial thought, which is more influenced by Germany than anything else. Mm -hmm. And there were some Croatian thinkers such as Ivo Pilar, who um, Stachwicz quite liked, who didn't deny that Croats were Slavs, but brought in this Aryan component mm. um, by saying that, yes, Croats are Slavs, they're Aryan Slavs that came here to the Balkans and retained most of their Aryan qualities, uh, whereas Serbs were Slavs, but considerably mixed with Vlachs uh, mm. and Gypsies go on, go on. Mm. Uh, to become this kind of dark haired savage nation oh, and that right. that the orthodox church was a way of them compensating for being inferior because the orthodox church is based on these inferior greek barbaric ideas of mysticism uh instead of sorry state, uh, those were the, uh, the hellenic greeks the uh they claim actually that that the greeks modern greeks have no relationship to um the, the Greeks of old. Well, a lot and of that, Greek, like ultra nationalists, think that too. Actually, yeah, they really see Greece, uh, Greeks, as pretty much the worst, which is in line with what a lot of Western Europeans were thinking at the time. Yeah. Either way, I mean, uh, the problem with Serbs isn't that you know they are um, gypsy Vlach Slavs, unlike Croats who are Aryan Slavs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who are Aryan Slavs and who How retained... How did they manage to retain that Aryan identity so well, I wonder? How did they well, by that? not mixing with the Vlachs so much. They mixed with some of the the better peoples. Are In uh, this in this are all Slavs Aryan, and then it was just the Serbs that lost the natural Aryanness of Slavicness? Uh, there's, there's some other weirdness, too, which... Um, yes, uh, <laughs> but yes. Uh, <laughs> well... What they understand to be Serbs is like this kind of deviant mixture of Greek, right, Albanians, right, right. Um, oh okay, uh, gypsies and Vlachs. Yeah, um, that yeah because of their like mystical religion are inherently devious and oh, rebellious. I thought you meant because they're like super fun, and those are just all the fun ones. No, uh, and, no. and the, oh. they're not good for statecraft. Uh, this is an important thing that would also come later with some of the other racial theories that they developed. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and that also kind of puts them in the same category as Jews, because um, Jews are also, of course, nomadic peoples. Um, and interestingly, I didn't know the stereotype about Serbs being um, a naturally uh, mercantile culture. Mm-hmm. Hmm. No. Um that one doesn't come out much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> well, but, but I mean, they is... were uh, probably, it's connected to, because they were like successful successful Serbs living in Zagreb and some of the bigger cities. And like, I think the f- like uh, the, uh, the, cro- the first Croatian bank, which was the name of a bank, was actually owned by a Serbian guy. Um, so maybe, yeah. Man, mm. all right. Serbs yeah, so cover this... a lot of like racial ground for... Uh, yeah, I mean... For the Ustasha. Yeah. Okay, so apart from having 17 rules for life and really, really hating Serbs, uh, what else is there to Ustasha ideology to talk about? Well, again, in this development, uh, when they were using kind of Ivo Pilar's ideas about about Serbs, it started to go kind of farther. Mm. 
And this is where it started to kind of go more, veer more into kind of national socialist Nazi ideas about race, in which Croats were not Slavs at all. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. The Croats were, in fact, in Iranian peoples Mm -hmm. whose homeland was in Iran somewhere, uh, and that they had come to the region and civilized the Slavs. Is this from like white Croatia? Is that... No, what Croatia is, that's like in Ukraine, no? Or somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, okay, okay. And uh, uh, Mladen uh, Mladen Lorkuic, who would later go on to become um, the Minister of Interior in the Ustasha government, was a major proponent of of this idea. And and this was that uh, Croats were not Slavs. They're, in fact, an Iranian peoples. And this was obvious because of their propensity for statecraft and civilization. Obvious, yeah. Uh, well, and that they, that these, do you need any they had adopted, evidence? they had adopted a Slavic language just kind of by chance of having like assimilated these Slavic peoples, but they had come and organized these, um, these Slavic tribes under one nation, mm-hmm. uh, under the Croatian nation, that they had organized them and that they were therefore spoke a Slavic lang- language, but not Slavs. And therefore, Slav, Slavic barbarians are just that. They're just Slavic barbarians. Uh, we happen to speak the same language as them, but we're not them. Mm. Hmm. There's Is there a like an exact analog to that on the Serbian side? Uh, I don't also, think that there's... I don't think that there's... Um, there's some crazy Indian shit, right? Like, yeah, uh, but none of none of them, I think, are anti-Slavic. And, and this was uh-huh, this wasn't an right. attempt to distance themselves from the pan-Slavism, right, right. right, that that formed, like, the core of, like, Illyrian thought and any kind of Yugoslav thought, which also had to do with the fact that, like, in pan-Slavism, small nations, you know, small Slavic tribes have to, you know, band together to, you know, be strong. And this is, this idea was that, okay, well, we're not Slavs at all, and in fact, we're not a small nation, because then they also included Muslims in Bosnia which added a good million or so people uh, mm-hmm. to the Croatian nation. And right. that made them a medium-sized European nation. Uh, but that is completely separate from, from these Slavs next door. Did they also like uh, mention how there is more of them than Slovenians? Yeah, probably. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, well, so their, their whole problem with Slovenians is that Slovenians assimilated too much, uh, whereas Croats like, maintain their identity. Yeah. I mean, this is a joke when usually when I'm in Croatia, someone usually, no matter what the subject of the conversation is, mentions how Slovenia is very, very small. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, I once met a guy in Slovenia, a Slovenian fellow, who told me that Slovenians are actually German and they're not Slavs. So, mm. so. But didn't some, um, I don't they're know if they were Ustasha, the but some Croatian nationalists believe that Croats are like gods or something like this? Do you know about this? Gods, uh, go, uh, like Gothic people, like uh, yes, yes. Well, um, that actually came from uh, German mm-hmm. um, scientists or whatever who, who <laughs> concluded, right. and uh, actually, Evo Pila, th- this is where this kind of like Aryan idea mm-hmm. comes from that they're like they're Slavs, but also Goths, mm-hmm. maybe, uh, uh, like d- dark Slavs, like, into, yes. like <laughs> depressive Slavs. <laughs> <laughs> So another kind of important feature of this developing Wustasha ideology and, and racial ideology is their attitude towards Muslims, Slavic Muslims in in, um, in Bosnia. I mean, certainly being both fascists and Catholics, they must have hated Muslims. Yes, one would imagine that would imagine. the whole problem with Serbs is that the Ottomans brought this foreign race onto right. their territory, uh, this mixture of every kind the Jewish of... Jewish gypsy block. Yeah. And the Ottomans brought that. This is important. They say that the Ottomans brought them onto their territory and thus they are foreign. They never belonged here. Um, we have to keep in mind also that, you know, at this time, Serbs made up a significant portion of the population of Croatia. I mean, it's like something like 20, 20 some percent of the population it wasn't, you know, insignificant at all. It was quite large. And so these, these, people were foreign, right? They had nothing to do with Croats. 
Yeah, yeah. Fuck they the were brought Ottomans. by the Ottomans. Yeah. So logically, you would think, they must well, hate okay, the if most if of if the Croats are the defenders of you know Western civilization, then Muslims are their natural enemy, right? Well, fascists are always really consistent, though. Uh, so I'm sure that they followed through on this. So how do you reconcile this this idea of defending Western civilization from kind of Eastern brutality and barbarism of like these Greek of uh, um gypsies with embracing, you know, the Islamic community. Well, it's that, okay, these were the purest of Croats that converted to Islam so that they could retain their Croatianness and their like genetic purity, but also that they were highly influential in statecraft in the Ottoman empire, mm. which made them, uh, part of the ruling class of the Ottoman Empire, which thus again proves this Croatian innate uh, ability towards statecraft and civilization. Mm. I, I love um, that you have this like, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to sugarcoat it, but you, you do have this way to enter the political class through the choice of conversion right? Which is ideally a choice you would make. And these guys interpret that as, well, they're racially superior. So that's why they made that choice, right? Yes. That's, yeah, that must really upset uh, Muslims, wouldn't you think? They kind of don't care about what most Muslims think about it. Um, Sure. (laughs) Of course, I mean, there was like a part of the Bosnian, Bosniak intelligentsia um, especially ones that were educated in Zagreb that did, a, you know, a, affiliate themselves, did associate themselves as Croats, right? They, okay. Mm-hmm. At the same time, there were also ones that, you know, like in the guided journal or whatever, who considered themselves Serbs. And a lot of people who were just, we are you know, what we are. Um, uh-huh. Okay. I and, mean, there was a Muslim component to the Ustasha movement. So there were... Oh, no, no, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. And... They also, of course, uh, took on this, I think it was, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Muhammad Hajiahic, who actually later became a communist, um, who said that uh, Muslims and Catholics in Bosnia uh, shared the same racial characteristics, language, culture, feelings, and writings. The racial affinity, uh, affinity of Muslims and Catholics in Bosnia could be seen in the in- intensity of their pigmentation. Um, so, okay. like, the Orthodox are dark, uh, ah. d- dark hair ah, okay. and, and, and uh, dark skinned, and um, well, yeah, uh, which is to be expected of immigrants of foreign blood um, and is a result of their nomadic lifestyles and, and whatever, which it, it's kind of funny when you think about it today, how, um, you know, it, Muslims are just coded as um, yeah. non-white in general. Uh these like Ustasha Muslims were all about talking about how they are the actually the most fair skinned blonde of all of the Croats. Um, La di da. I mean, uh, today, like one of the main pro Ustasha like ideologues, intellectuals, he's a historian uh, in Zagreb. He's a he's a he's a Muslim guy called yeah, like Has- Hasan Begovic. Hasan Begovic. Yeah. So right. he's a historian and he. He wrote, a, I think his PhD thesis on, is on how much like Ustashas and maybe Frankovci, I'm not sure, uh, how much they were like the only, as far as I understand, like Croatian nationalist movement, they saw uh, Croatian nation as having these two pillars, like the Catholic one and the Muslim one. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean... We also have to remember that at the time uh, there was massive emigration of Muslims from Yugoslavia to Turkey, mm-hmm. which was fully encouraged by the state, and especially in in areas um, in Montenegro and, and Serbia. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, people were leaving, especially in the twenties and thirties, in, in huge numbers, right? Mm. Um, and a lot of the Muslim movements at the time were trying to curb that kind of emigration, and also just basically be accepted by, by any of them. Yeah. Right. Um, and that is to say, it isn't to say that like, you know, I don't think that a lot of people in Zagreb um, gave a flying fuck about Muslims or knew very much about them. Um, but it was an important thing for Muslim intellectuals to at least not be yeah. 
to at least be embraced by one of these ideologies. I mean, uh, sure. We'll do a, another episode on specifically um, Bosnia and uh, Bosnian and, and Albanian nationalism at the time. But a lot of it was, you know, geared, uh, Mehmet Spahu, who was the leader of the um, the largest Muslim party, the Yugoslav Muslim Organization, was more or less just ready to be a Serb if they would take him. Mm-hmm. The problem is that, you know, the, the Serbian national identity was so anti-Islamic in its character mm-hmm. um, that they yeah. continually rejected Yeah, they did that like yeah. a few times in history because it, it, the Serbian nationalism was so dominated by the Serbian Orthodox Church. And it just they just said that you have to be an Orthodox Christian in order to be Serbian. So they missed out on like a lot of like I think we mentioned this like Serbian Catholic movement in Dubrovnik, which was very strong and led by the Catholic priests there that very right. much wanted to be accepted as Serbs and uh, but they were like rejected. Um, so and I remember like there was uh, remember one instance of like there were like some Muslims in the, in the Chetniks during the Second World War. And one of them wrote how he was very hurt because he was at one meeting somewhere of Chetniks. And then, like, I think, a, like, an Orthodox priest who was a Chetnik or someone said, like, Ayo, it's great that you are with us, but when will you convert to the faith, like, back to the original faith of your fathers? Yeah. And this Muslim guy was very offended, like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, I'm a Muslim, like, I was never Orthodox or, you know. So they were right. really not accept, accepting of Muslims as Serbs, you know. Mm-hmm. Unless they yes, and this is, yeah. right, and, and this is where um, Croatian and spe- specifically Ustasha thought thought uh, was 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 very di- very different because they based. I mean, okay, there's a lot of talk, and this is certainly true of the Ustasha connection to the Catholic Church, and this would become very important, I think, later, especially after the war, in terms of how um, Ustasha war criminals left. Um, former Yugoslavia. Um, but it also seems kind of an but, opportunistic connection, no? Because Yes, like, yes. But uh, mm. because ideologically, mm. they had their kind of own idea of like the Volksgemeinschaft or whatever mm. uh, of of the German like national yeah. character, which was the Narodna um, Zajnica, mm. like the, the national community. Mm-hmm. And to them, it didn't matter whether you were Muslim or Catholic as long as you were Croat, yeah. Above all, well, the, now of the course, most Muslims. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Now a lot of a lot of Muslims didn't consider themselves even the ones that were Muslim and identified as Croats. Identified, I think, usually first, from what I could tell, as Muslims and then as Croats. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the Ustash ideology of, of this kind of national community, there was space for both, right? But not the Orthodox. Yeah. <laughs> Later, you would kind of see this. They they would revise this. But again, like I said, Ustasha ideology is very inconsistent because when when they finally took power, there were all kinds of different factions, and at certain times, some were favored more than others. But in general, the national community to the Ustashas is Catholic and Muslim, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, the like these ideological principles of their movement that we read, they don't really have any religious content in it. Like, at yeah. some point they said, like, and family should be based on religious principles, which is like... Right, right. but it doesn't specify yeah. which one. Yeah, exactly. And this is important mm-hmm. because they emphasize this later when they're in power. Yeah. Uh, to, especially to appeal to, to Muslims. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So on their university campuses, as as Ray mentioned, in, in Belgrade, there was quite a bit of conflict between um, nationalist and anti-fascist students. In Zagreb, the, si- the situation was was quite similar. Uh, in the beginning, most of it was vying for controls of these various different um, student organizations, uh, which would be elected by, by the students, uh, which until kind of the late 30s were mostly dominated by anti-fascist or at least pro-Yugoslav uh, student organizations. Now, things started to ramp up around the Spanish Civil War, um, kind of on on both sides. A lot of Yugoslavs, and especially uh, from Croatia, went to fight on on the Republican side, both from the Communist Party, but also from the left wing of the Peasant Party. And at the same time, uh, the right wing students 
in in Croatia were feeling kind of emboldened by by the you know the na- growing nationalist sentiment. Um, and there was a particular incident that occurred in 1936 around the death of an Ustasha activist, Stipe Javor, who died in Yugoslav prison. Um, he was an associate of, of Pavelic. Uh, people say he was probably tortured to death in, in prison in Sremska Mitrovica. Um, either way, there was, a, there was a large confrontation on the grounds of the University of Zagreb's campus uh, between anti-fascist students and Ustasha students. Now, at the end of this, um, leftist and anti-fascist student Krista was was stabbed to death by a group of uh, Frankist or Ustasha students. Um, who, he kind of became a martyr for the, you know the kind of leftist and anti-fascists in um, in the student movement in Zagreb. In fact, they would during World War II avenge his death by bombing um, uh, an Ustasha student group uh, in 1941. Wow. Um, Specifically, you know, to, to avenge his death, uh, but there were also several other um, leftist and anti-fascist students who were wounded in this. Um, now, according to the nationalist students, they were all Serbs and Jews, uh, okay. and they called them uh, Jovans and Mordechais, okay. uh, which is Jovans being kind of like a stereotypically Serbian name to them, and Mordechai obviously being Jewish. And um, and so they felt absolutely no remorse uh, for for the death of this of this student because um, you know of course the the university is overrun by Jews and Serbs. Uh, there were some other kind of notable incidents as well, which some of which kind of carry on to um, what you see today with with the Croatian nationalists. For example, they um, they beat a professor uh, simply for having his book published in Cyrillic. Mm. Um, which is a, which is a very common thing even today among Croatian nationalists is, is this like attack on on Cyrillic. It's, but I also it's... claim that Cyrillic is an ancient like Croatian alphabet. No, shh. <laughs> 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 I mean, obviously there are yeah. a ton of contradictions here. Yeah. Um, yeah, like we're all, we're all nationalist movements. I mean, yes, yes. Yeah, that's just nothing but contradictions the whole way. So Pavel is just sitting in house arrest in Italy. Um, Yugoslavia is relatively unstable. The kingdom of Yugoslavia is unstable. Um, and there's quite a bit of political maneuvering going on in the lead up to the Second World War. Uh, first of all, Pavlic has no idea that within a couple years, he's going to be handed a state. Um, okay. Yeah, I was just thinking that. It, it looked very much like the kingdom of Yugoslavia was going to join the Axis powers. Uh, in fact, Hitler preferred this as an option and that did happen. Uh, but of course, very quickly, uh, it went in the other direction. Yeah. So Yugoslavia was, was poised to join the Axis powers and it did. Uh, but within a day, <laughs> Right. <laughs> of it joining the Axis powers, a combination of both popular demonstrations and a military coup that occurred in Belgrade realigned them with the Allies. Uh, Hitler did not take kindly of this. And, and, and of course, there are some indications that Hitler, of course, did not want an independent Croatian state. He was kind of wary of giving the Italians that much power um, and would have preferred like a unitary Yugoslavia that was in the Axis. But when that was out of the picture, it was full reign for for the Ustashas to get the state that they dreamed of. And they would get that state in 1941, following the German and Italian invasions of Yugoslavia um, that started with the bombing of, of Belgrade. It's Operation uh, Revenge or something like that. Uh, and that's where we'll pick up for the next episode, a follow-up episode on the Ustashas, on what they actually did when they were in power, and their brief but very, very bloody reign. Yeah, extremely so. here from the empire never ended 
This has been one of our weekly free episodes for free people. But for premium people, we also have weekly premium episodes, which you can get at patreon.com slash tenepod, T-E-N-E-P-O-D. And also follow our various social media things in the in the show description there. Like and subscribe them. Follow them. Like and sub- follow and subscribe. Follow them. Do it.